Hello and welcome to a special video. This video is on your SLO and I wanted to go through and give you a video just on some pointers, what to do, what not to do, since that is a big assignment coming up at the end of the month. Now, this is going to be a video for all three of the subjects I teach, World History 1, World History 2, U.S. History 2. So I've put all of your questions up here at once. Now, where do you find these questions? They're in Blackboard on the syllabus. They're in Blackboard in the SLO folder as well. If you're in World History 1, you have to do a five to seven page essay that explains the causes and effects of these Protestant Reformation. If you're in World History 2, you have to do a five to seven page essay that explains the causes of World War I. And if you're in US History 2, it's a five to seven page essay explaining the events of 1968. Now, at first, I know that sounds hard. Some of you may have never written a five to seven page essay before, but I promise with these topics, they're big. There's a lot of detail. Five to seven pages is not difficult. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you. So don't freak out when you hear, oh my goodness, five to seven pages. These essays have to be in Chicago style. And some of you have probably never heard of Chicago style. Well, the official name is the Chicago Manual of Style. Sometimes it's called Turabian. Uh, either way, they're basically the same thing. It's a style citation that is used by both historians and anthropologists. Uh, it's not much different than APA or MLA. Most of the same information is there. It's just presented differently. Uh, the Chicago Manual Style has footnotes and it has a bibliography. Uh, the footnote, it's going to tell you where you found your information and what page it's on. And then a bibliography, it's just a list of sources that you used and you can put things in your bibliography that you didn't footnote. Maybe you read an article and decided, hey, that doesn't work for me. That still counts as a source that you referred to. Now, what does it look like? Let me pull in a website here. This is easybib.com. And let's go down to citing your sources. Uh, for history, we use this first source called, or this first style called Notes in Bibliography. And this gives you a little information on what's expected. Uh, we're history, so we're going to use notes and bibliography. Uh, sources are cited in footnotes. There's a bibliography, and it's somewhat flexible. And what does it look like? Well, here we go. When you do a full footnote citation, you've got the author's name, you've got the name of the book, the article, the newspaper article, whatever it might be, and then you have the information about where it is printed. And usually you would also have a page number here so anybody could find the page number that you got the information from. There is also a website called the Purdue Owl, Purdue Online Writing Lab, and it has the Chicago Style Guide here as well. This is actually linked in Blackboard. So if you go into your Blackboard and you click Lessons and you click on uh, Chicago Citations, there's a link to this website available there. And this will show you pretty much everything you need, like citation styles for books, citation styles for periodicals and journals, citation of uh, styles for websites. So the Chicago Manual of Style is broken down on the Purdue OWL website for you. But I've tried to make it even easier than that for you. 
So you can see I've provided a Chicago style quick guide. You can print out. There's the link to the Purdue Owl Chicago Manual of Style. And there's a link to that easy bid website, Chicago Turabian Style Guide. I'm hoping between the quick guide you can print out, the Purdue Owl website, and the Turabian Style Guide website that you should be able to do this and you should be able to figure it out. But of course, if you can't, if you have any questions, email me and I will help you. So don't think you're in this alone. Now once again, examples. A footnote for a book with one author, it would have the first name, last name, title of the book, where it was published, and then a page number. Bibliography, almost the same information except it's last name and then first name, and you leave out the page number. Now how do you do footnotes? Some of you may have never done these, and I know some of you use Microsoft Word, some of you use Google Docs, so I've put it together a little screenshot here so you can see how they're both done but I'll also show you too. So if I am in Microsoft Word and let's say I need to put a footnote in I have gotten my information from somewhere. The Vikings exploited their farmland to the full resulting in a loss of fertility. Maybe I got that from Vikings Today. It's a made-up newspaper. Well, if I needed to do a citation, a footnote for this, I would click and make sure that the little cursor is at the end of the punctuation. Then I go up to references. And then I click where it says insert footnote. Now in Microsoft Word, once I click insert footnote, it's automatically going to format it. I don't have to format anything I just have to touch that button. Because this is my first footnote, you're going to see a little number one appear next to that period, and then you'll see that I can type at the bottom of the page. All right, so you can see there's my little footnote. It put the one in all by itself, and then at the bottom of the page, you'll also see a number one. And this is where I would put in my information here. And you can see there using the citation quick guide my first name, my last name, the name of the book, where it was published, and the page number. Now another really cool thing about Microsoft Word is if I need to do another citation, let's say the Vikings refuse to learn from the Inuit, if I have gotten that from somewhere, I do the same thing. I put the cursor after the period, I click insert footnote, and because this is footnote number two, a little number two will appear, and then I will be able to type at the bottom of the screen again. So there's my little number two, and now I can type more info right there. Now what about those of you who use Google Docs? Let me pull in my Google Docs. It's almost the same thing. Um, you find wherever you need to do your citation, we'll say it's right there. You make sure the cursor's after the period. And you go to insert. And then you click footnote. And just like Microsoft Word, it puts that funny little one in. And then you can type down at the bottom. Now I do encourage you to practice this a little bit on your own. Um, just to get used to doing it, just to learn how to do it. That way it's not going to be a surprise when you get to doing your SLO and you don't freak out and say, oh my god, I don't know what to do. Uh, just practice a little bit now and it'll make it easier the more times you do it. Now research, what about doing the research? Well, number one, 
be careful with Google. Anybody can make a website. Number two, be careful with Wikipedia. Anybody can edit a Wikipedia article. The best places to go for research, number one, go talk to your librarian. Each of our campuses have a librarian and it is their job. They are paid to help you find sources. They're paid to help you research. Uh, other than going and speaking to the librarian, the next best place is gonna be Galileo. And Galileo is accessible if you log into Blackboard, which you have to be to be watching this. It's on the front page on the bottom right. And you'll see the picture that says, welcome to Galileo, access Galileo. Now, how do you use Galileo? Well, first thing, click where it says databases by subject. And then where it says view all subjects, click that. Look for history in the list of databases or in the list of subjects. And then you should find something called academic search complete. Right here, it says Access Galileo. Click there. Databases by subject. Click View All Subjects. Got to look for history. It's not on this page, so we'll click Next. There it is down at the bottom. And then we click Academic Search Complete. Why? Because that's the easiest one for us to use. And that brings you to what looks almost like a Google search bar. Now searching in Galileo, you have to select limiters. Since we're doing academic search, you have to choose full text and you have to choose scholarly. The reason you do that is you want the full article and you wanna make sure it's peer reviewed, meaning it is widely accepted by other historians. You don't want some random person publishing a an article passing themselves off as an expert but in reality it's my three-year-old toddler pretending to be an expert now how do you do that how do you set your limiters you look for where it says limit your results you click on full text click on scholarly now last but not least you need to enter in keywords now, if you check your question, there are some keywords in there. Uh, for example, U.S. History 2, 1968. Or if you look up 1968 on Wikipedia, you might find some names like Martin Luther King Jr. Or you might find some names like Robert F. Kennedy. Those are names you might want to search. If you're doing World History 2, you've got some terms like nationalism and militarism you could search. Or if you're doing World War I, Reformation, Counter-Reformation, Catholic Reformation. Those are all good places to start. So, nationalism. There are lots of different options here, but if you look, nationalism and World War I is an option. So we search. And if you are doing the World History 2 SLO, this one search term, Nationalism World War I, brings up 296 results. Now it's your job to figure out which ones you can and cannot use for this SLO. Let's change this from nationalism to militarism and World War I. There's another 47 results. Now, what if you're in World History One and you're doing the Reformation? Protestant Reformation. You got Protestant Reformation, Protestantism, Protestant Reformation effects, Protestant Reformation causes. So just that one search word can help you in World History One as well. Protestant Reformation causes brings up two results but you can play with that and find some different names um, for example Martin Luther is a big name in the 
Reformation. Don't look up Martin Luther King Jr. That's for 1968. But if you're doing World History One, it's just regular Martin Luther. There's 5,000 results from Martin Luther. And then last but not least, if you're doing U.S. History Two, just start with 1968. Got 1968 Democratic Convention, 1968 Olympics, 1968 Black Power, 1968 Presidential Election, 1968 Riots. So just typing in the number 1968 can help you if you're doing U.S. History too. Now, when do you cite your sources? Uh, easy answer is whenever an idea doesn't come from your head, you're borrowing an idea from somewhere else. But more specifically, two or more words verbatim, when you introduce facts that are found in a source, when you paraphrase a source, or when you prevent present information that's not considered common knowledge. Think, if your grandmother doesn't know it, you should probably cite it. And where did I get this information from? Well, I cited my source down there at the bottom. Um, all of this right here is from a website provided by Yale University. And it's called Warning When You Must Cite. And I've done a website citation there for you. Now, last but not least, you have to make sure you analyze your sources. Uh, what I mean by that is you can't just copy and paste, you can't just do a laundry list of sources and say, okay, I've got five pages of cited sources, I'm done. No, 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 no. You have to analyze. And what I, what I mean by that is you have to explain how and why the source you've cited, the source you're using, is important. It's not enough just to copy and paste, you have to explain its use. So if you're doing the SLO on World War I, you have to explain why your source on nationalism was important to World War I, or why your source on imperialism was important to World War I. If you're doing World History I, you have to explain why Martin Luther was important to the Reformation, etc., etc. And I have here just kind of a general rule of thumb. For each citation you use, for each quotation you use, spend the next paragraph explaining the importance of that citation, the importance of your, your source to your paper. Now there's a lot more I could tell you, but I, I have to keep it short to keep your attention. Uh, if you have any more questions, just email, or if you're in one of my face-to-face -face classes, just stop by after class and I'll be more than happy to help you. But uh, I hope that your spring break has gone well. And if you're watching this after spring break, well, I still hope your spring break went well. Um, we'll see you around. Bye.